I'm starting to wear corduroys and cargo pants and mm. like all this kind of stuff because I'm thinking like, oh, that's I need to look like a Christian. I mean, but it was to the point where I even tried to perm my hair and mm. dyed it, you know, dyed it blonde because I'm like thinking wow. I'm I need to look like a Christian. To me, it was a Christian. It wasn't a white person, but the way it was presented to me was that they're one and the same. This is Where You're From, an origin story podcast at the intersection of faith and culture that digs into the influences and experiences that shape who we are today. Join us as we gain insight into the Bible's wisdom for all, regardless of where we're from. Hey, y'all, this is Rasul Berry. Thanks for joining me on Where You're From. This week, I want to share my conversation with Dr. Vince Bantu. Vince is a pastor, author, editor, apologist, professor, and president of both the Society of Gospel Haymano and the Meacham School of Haymano. Vince is a force of nature and is devoted to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations. You can find out more about Vince by clicking the links in the show notes or by visiting whereyou'refrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Please join me as I ask Vince Bantu, where you're from? Hey, hey, good to see you, brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Coming at you from where I'm from over here on the west side of St. Louis. Yeah, Missouri. Nice. And, and you were born there? Yeah, yeah. I'm born and raised. Uh, man, like we go back as far as I can trace uh, in St. Louis, mm. you know, multiple generations. Yeah. Whole okay. Family. And I noticed you mentioned specifically West St. Louis. Is that the part of the town that you grew up in as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the west side, wild, wild west. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, for those of us that may not be acquainted with that geography in St. Louis, kind of paint a picture for us about when you say West St. Louis, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it actually can mean pretty starkly different things because I, I would say it's probably the most dramatically racially segregated city I've ever seen, mm-hmm. like in the United States, because every city has segregation. But St. Louis has one street that literally cuts the entire city in half and everything on that side of the street is black and low income and everything on this side of the street is white and it's more like higher income. Mm. And, you know, you drive down that street from city limit to city limit and it's just consistent how on that side of the street, you'll see predatory payday loan, check cash in places, liquor stores, dilapidated buildings. Then on this side, you see yoga studios and Mm. organic tea shops and like loft buildings. And, and that street that I was talking about, it runs through the West side. Mm. (laughs) So if you say you're from the North side, then that everybody knows what that means. If you say you're from the South side, then everybody knows what that means. But if you're from the West side, it could be either one. So Mm. I'm from the West side, North of that, that line. The hood side. Okay, I was about to say, so not the yoga (laughs) studio side, the payday loan side. (laughs) But I grew up like only a mile north of that line. So Mm. I could walk. And I and me and my friends used to walk, you know, down uh, past that line because that's where all the stuff to do is. That's where all the shops and stores and everything is. So we could walk down there and, you know, all of a sudden, as soon as we cross that line, then police are all of a sudden looking at you like, you know, what are you doing here? Like, da, da, da. but then once you come north of that line, you get broke into and you call the police. They take hours to show up. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Tell me about your parents. Did they grow up on the west side, too? Yeah. So actually, they didn't. My dad grew up in the North Side, right in the heart of the black community. But actually, you know, it was in the 40s and 50s when St. Louis was transitioning. So I mentioned that, you know, north of that street is black. But, you know, 100 years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm. 100 years ago, the entire city was white. And you had to be white and wealthy to live in the city, period. And surrounding areas were where the lower income whites lived. And black folks were really just in small pockets also outside of the city, like in East St. Louis or places like Kenlock, Missouri, the first independent black community in Missouri. So, yeah, nobody could live, you know, in that area. And my mom actually grew up, you know, my mom is white and she grew up in a lower income community outside of the city. And my dad grew up in the north side of the city, but he grew up as black folks were continuously moving further west and as civil rights and housing issues started to open up. And actually, a lot of that happened in St. Louis. So my dad grew up in the north side of the city, but but he grew up in an, 
you could say integrated, you know, <laughs> but but I like Saul Alinsky's definition of integrated neighborhood that is really just a community that is between when the first black person arrives and when the last white person leaves. Got it. And that's really exactly kind of what happened in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And and so my dad was continually moving west in the north side of the city. And as blacks move further west in that northern part, whites continue to move further out. And that's still happening. So when, when my parents moved into the west side, they actually strategically chose it as an interracial couple couple in the 70s, right? Only a few years after that was even legal. They intentionally moved into the West Side because at that time where my dad grew up had become completely black and where my mom was from was all white and they wanted to live in a mixed neighborhood so that I would be connected to, you know, all of my ancestry and all of my peoplehood because that neighborhood at the West Side at that time was integrated. But really, again, it was, I would say it was really just, you know, people were not done leaving yet. (laughs) And so when they moved into the neighborhood in the seventies, it was, it was mixed in the sense of both people groups present. But by the time I was growing up there in the eighties, it had become all black and all the white folks, except my mother had left. Yeah. So I'm already picking up an interesting thread. You mentioned that St. Louis has this history of a very racially, like you said, the most racially segregated city that you've seen in America. And then you mentioned that your parents are white and black. So tell me a little bit about that story and and maybe what their experiences were kind of breaking some of those barriers at a time when that was pretty rare. Yeah, they they met in in school and, you know, the the vocational school here in St. Louis that my dad was going to to be a plumber. My mom was working there as an admin and they they met and started dating and and they just hit it right off. And, And, you know, thankfully, they didn't really have a lot of problems in the family. You know, my mom's parents were very accepting of it. My dad's parents were, his dad was a little bit more hesitant about it because my grandfather actually grew up in East St. Louis in the 19 teens. And if also another part of St. Louis history is 1917. A lot of people know about the Tulsa massacre that happened in 1921 in Greenville. But four years earlier, there was another massacre in East St. Louis that was on the same level as the Tulsa one. So much so that it actually engendered a silent protest protests by in your city, uh, up and down Fifth Avenue, people in New York City were protesting what happened in East St. Louis, that hundreds of, of black people were killed by police and National Guard and, and rioting citizens in East St. Louis. And my granddad grew up in that, mm. in that hostility and then that and that terror, really that terrorizing. He, he told us stories about how his people would try to go through the black community in East St. Louis as blacks were moving up in the Great Migration. And mm. but again, really before coming into the Missouri side of St. Louis, first settling in East St. Louis and how whites were trying to discourage that by terrorizing people coming into their homes and just vandalizing things and assaulting mm. people. And so he would tell stories about how his mother took him and his eight siblings out into the, the grass uh, and they would ha- hide all night long and hide outside of their own home to hide from these people attacking them. And they would even get mosquitoes biting at them and they would be trying to scream, but the mom would close their mouth shut because they didn't want them to find him. And so, you know, he grew up in these kinds of traumatic things. And so, mm. you know, he had a lot of hesitance with white people at first, but but after you know a little while of getting close, he ended up being like super close with my mom and loving her as a daughter, and so wow. and they they had all kinds of things. My dad, uh, you know, he was one of the first black plumbers in the city of St. Louis, and he even had assaults on his life because he was the only one in the apprenticeship and in, in the school he was in, and uh, other classmates didn't like that. And they literally even tried to take his life. Uh, and he has injuries from that to this day. So they, when they were seen together, they went through all kinds of, of mm. difficult things, but God has always been keeping them through that. And they're coming up on 50 years. Uh, mm. Yeah. Just in a few years. So that's amazing. Glory to God. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's an amazing story. And I also think it's interesting how your grandfather's hesitance had not anything to do with his like personal racial animus, but had everything to do with the trauma of what he had seen in this racial massacre that had happened, you know, in his youth. So your parents get together through all of those different aspects of adversity. And are you like the only child or the oldest or what's the birth order situation at home? Yeah, my my dad, he was married before. So I have a half sister and uh, yeah, she lives in St. Louis and I have an older brother and he's in the Marine Corps. He's out in California and he was from my mom also. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the baby. I'm the baby of the family. <laughs> <laughs> okay, me too. Me too. So we can relate to that. So, and they always remind us, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, you mentioned kind of growing up in the 80s, like how did you experience, you know, West St. Louis? Like what were your memories in your formative years growing up? 
Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a great neighborhood. You know, I like our generation teases these young people today. Get off them iPads and them iPhones. But you know, we're, I was in that generation, the first one with the Nintendo and the <laughs> and the Mario Brothers, and we was on the video games too. You know, but at the same time, we were outside, and so I think about you know the West Side, the block that I came up on. Me and my friends from the neighborhood, we'd be outside playing all day long, running up and down mm. the street, going and stealing candy from the corner store, getting in trouble, and uh, just you know, it was like a utopia. Even though mm. there was like some traumatic things like you know like gunshots and we jump down under the windows and mm. you know sometimes seeing people running for their life down the street and things like that but i just didn't think of it as like the hood like at that time i was just thinking about like just running outside to see what's going on today and playing with my mm. friends but you know actually this is where in my life where i really felt uh like biracial identity is a is a funny thing but i you know the short of it is i've always identified as a black man and that's always been my experience and uh had a lot of um you know difficulties with racism myself, actually, because we actually moved to another community when I was a teenager, which was a white neighborhood and it was a lower income white neighborhood. And so I actually went through extreme racism in that community, like like 1960s level racism, but it was in the 90s. <laughs> and mm. it was, again, one of those neighborhoods in transition, which is now actually predominantly black. Uh, so I say all that to say I've always identified as black. But I, you know, I also, you know, I also acknowledge that I'm also half white and a white mother and I'm, you know, very proud of, I love her. And, and, you know, I've, I've never felt like I've had the experience of a white person, you know, Mm -hmm. that as I move around the world, but I will say the one experience that I did feel like I had white privilege, um, at least compared to my neighbors, my friends in my neighborhood was that my mom actually went to the school board and got me into a school on the other side of that line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it was because she went in there and said, I want my my kids to not go to school in the neighborhood we live, but to go into another neighborhood. And I wonder if she had been black, if that would have happened. So my brother and I were afforded the opportunity to go to a nicer, or I guess you could say more well-resourced school that was on the other side of that line. It was only like two miles away. Mm. And they said, okay, you can take them there, but you got to drive them every day. So my mom drove us to school every single day and picked us up because the buses wouldn't come get us because we weren't supposed to go there. Man, I'm telling you, like every single day, I was driving from my neighborhood only two miles away. Mm. And in that two miles, you went from like projects to mansions. Mm. And so being in school there all day and then coming back home and then playing outside with my friends and they were going to the school in the neighborhood. Mm. And so now a lot of my friends that I grew up with, like, you know, uh, you know, different things have happened. And so I, I got instilled from an early age of like, kind of like being maybe one of the most privileged people in an extremely oppressed community. So I didn't have a sense of like, you know, being oppressed, but I was like in an oppressed community, but I was just always comparing myself. I ended up going to Wheaton college and then I went there and I was like, Oh man, like, dang, I I guess I had it rough. I just never thought about that. (laughs) So I got around all these like, you know, Wheaton students and stuff like, dang, but I never Mm. thought about it growing up. I was always had this sense of I'm so privileged. And I had this deep seated sense that was in me at that early age of like, like God is is doing something in me because I got saved early too. I was like I was like seven years old. You know, my mom was really the first Christian in our family, and she shared the gospel with me, and I believed on Christ. I had a sense of my depravity, my need for salvation, because you know, again, part of that rowdiness in my community it really affected me, and mm. even like some of the issues, you know, in my household, because my dad actually didn't get saved until later. I mean, he's saved now, praise God, and you know, now my parents have a great marriage. But when I was a kid, that wasn't the case, and so he actually wasn't around uh, when I was when I was growing up. So it's kind of like I. Also also had again a weird mix of like I know what it is to grow up in a single parent household, but I also know what it is to have both parents because my parents were separated for over a decade from the wow. time I was born up until I was about thirteen. Wait, and, okay, hold on, pause. Yeah. So for the earliest part of your time period, you mentioned coming to faith at seven through your mom. At that point, your dad wasn't at home. No, he he wasn't at home. He lived on, you know, the whole other side of town, but I knew him like he came over and watched us when my mom had to work. So even that was like, again, I'm comparing myself to my, my friends in the community, many of whom didn't even know their fathers or they were never around. Whereas my, like my dad, when he would come over and watch us, you know, he would come outside and tell people to knock that stuff off. So it's like, you know, even having that much presence was like, you know, comparatively, but yeah, they weren't together and he wasn't saved, but he ended up getting saved later. Uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, when I was in high school. But yeah, I got saved when I was young. But, you know, because of the violence in my household and in the neighborhood, in the community and all that, you know, I just was also participating in that. So, I, you know, you know, was fighting all the time. I used to get kicked mm-hmm. out of school, even from kindergarten wow. and all the way up until early high school. So I had a sense of like my own sinfulness. Mm-hmm. And even my ne- dad not being around at that time, you know, that actually made it made the gospel more appealing to me gotcha. because it was this sense that, you know, even though my earthly father's not around, mm. I have a heavenly father who actually came down and died for my sins. And I know I need that. And mm. so I trusted in God consciously when I was seven years old. And there was a church that again was just two miles away, mm. but it was on that other side, you mm. know, of that line. And it was a small non-denominational Bible church. And they used to come into our neighborhood and try to do outreach in the mm. hood. And that was how we got connected with them. They were coming in and doing evangelism in our neighborhood. And they met, saw my mom, saw my mom found out about that church and we started going there and, and I wanted to go, you know, consciously I was, I, and she made it very clear, like this has to be your relationship with God. Mm. And even my mom was actually the first Christian in our family because her mm. parents were, you know, they would have identified as Christian, but they, right. you know, that wasn't really, they, you know, you know how that go. Right. But my mom was the first one that had a strong encounter with Jesus when she was a teenager. And so that was even how she ended up staying strong in all those years of my mm. parents having real difficulty that right. she did didn't divorce my dad, but she would really minister to him. And that's mm. ultimately after years what brought him to faith and where he bowed his knees and gave wow. his life to Christ as well. That's powerful. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's a time where she advocates for you and puts you into this different, like you said, better resource school. But then at some point she actually, you, you, you mentioned y'all move in high school. Was that move related to your dad coming back or was that moved before that? And you just kind of, it was, it was before that. And again, okay. my mom was, she's a, she's a warrior mm. because two things had happened at that time. Number one, like I said, you know, we actually grew up and this is the nineties, right? So that's when like all that Crip and blood stuff was really right. big. And so we grew up in a Crip neighborhood and my brother's a little older to me. So he started doing that whole thing. So wow. he was representing, you know, rolling sixties. Like that was, I never did none of that stuff, but I, but you would have never caught me wearing red. And so I was still like kind of by association, like, you know, I was saved and I never did none of that stuff, but he was doing that. So he was in the streets and he was really doing that little, you know, thug thing when he was in high school. And, and that was causing my mom a lot of problems. And then number two, my dad's mom actually got sick with lung cancer and she moved in with us. And so, again, what a powerful gospel witness that my mom, who is saved, you know, got a husband that's all kind of craziness going on on the side of town. Only white woman in this neighborhood raising two black boys by herself, now taking care of her Mm -hmm her mother-in-law, even when my dad wasn't uh, at that time. Mm. And so again, I think that's really what I think a big part of what finally did it for him was seeing my mother just caring for everybody by herself. And it was actually right after my grandmother died because of the lung cancer that that was soon after that my dad gave his life to Christ, Mm. uh, just seeing my mom's gospel witness and all of that. But, you know, with her having to take care of me, uh, having to take care of my brother, who's now running the streets, he's not, he wasn't even at home anymore. He was always in and out of juvie and all that kind of stuff. And dealing Dealing with my dying grandmother, my mom was like, all right, I need a little bit of help. And so she moved back to her neighborhood, which, you know, was a, a all white, uh, kind of lower income neighborhood. And we moved right across the street from my other grandparents uh, because she needed some help. Got so it. we were we, at that point, I was about 12. We moved across the street from my grandparents. And then I moved from an all black neighborhood to an all white neighborhood. But it was like a lower income white neighborhood. Got it. And so, so yeah, you, yeah. you know, can you give us an example? You mentioned some of the difficulties you experienced experience in that move. Just paint a picture for me. Yeah, it was it was crazy. When you think about like Dr. King bringing protesters and then all the angry white citizens just looking and just like, you know, mm. like get get out of our neighborhood. Like that was literally what it felt like walking around that neighborhood every single day. I remember one day I was in my own back porch, you know, all day and I was painting the back porch and there was a dude, somebody from the street behind us was was calling me a nigger like all day long. Like, wow. you know, it was weird. And we had to call the police. This is the trippy thing is like, this is after my dad moved back in. I was like, am I hearing things? And I went and got my dad. I was like, dad, I think somebody over here calling me. And then he came outside to listen and then he heard it. My dad got real mad. He called the police. Police came to our house later on and were like, yeah, we told them to knock it off. And later I was like, wait a minute, how do you know where to go? <laughs> we didn't even tell him where. We just heard it was from the street behind us. I didn't know which one. So how did you know where to go? He went over to Billy Bob and was like, hey, man, I don't like it either. I don't like that they're in our neighborhood either, but you can't do that no more. It's the 90s. Wow. But it was just that kind of stuff all the time. I mm. mean, there was a strip club right next to my high school. And then mm. there was like a liquor store and there was a Harley Davidson shop. It was all these like white dudes who would just be drunk and like throwing bottles at me one day. Like, And then, oh, don't even get me started on police. 
like, you know, just walking down the street. What are you doing? Where are you going? Like, I'm, I'm walking home, like my house right there, like just all the time. And then like my brother was with me. Then it'd be a thing because he want to talk back. And now next thing you know, both of us are on the hood of the cop car getting patted down. And I'm just like, dang, why don't you be quiet so we can go home? Wow. Oh, man. Like when that Mike Brown thing happened in 2014, I was like, yep, because Ferguson had a similar history of being historically white, but more and more black people moving in. Right. And the one I was in was called St. John. The one we moved to that it was it's right next to Ferguson. It's very similar. That whole part of St. Louis is insane. Just right. policing people on on all kind of things because it's all these little low income municipalities that are becoming more black, but the leadership is all white. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that your own personal experience kind of confirmed some of the the seeds that caused the explosion, so to speak, of Ferguson, which was you know Department of Justice later you know studied and said, hey, there's been systemic racism. Black people being targeted by law enforcement, ticketed at higher numbers, harassed. And so the particular moment of Mike Brown, you know, being killed and laying on the street, it wasn't just that moment that caused the eruption. It was all these other things. And you living in St. John as a young black man growing up immediately identified the same story. I was living in in Jersey when it happened because I was finishing my Ph.D., and when I just saw the name Ferguson resounding all over the world, I was surreal because I was like, I grew up there, but like, if you ain't from St. Louis, you ain't never heard of Ferguson before. But now right. the whole world is talking about Ferguson. Right. But when I saw people burning down stores, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, condoning that at all. But I was like, I understand exactly why right. they are angry because what happened to Mike Brown almost happened to me because right. I was walking down my own street and I had a cop put his gun in my face because I had my hands in my pockets and he felt threatened. Wow. And I was like 15 years old. So I was like a second from getting killed myself wow. again, because it's in some ways it's actually worse here when we moved out the hood hood and we moved to this area because in the hood hood, like I said, you call the police when you get broke into, they show up an hour later mm. because it's a completely abandoned community. Wow. And then when you go way out in the suburbs, it's it's inaccessible. But mm. those inner ring suburbs right. where black people are moving into, that's actually where most of the hostility is mm. because it's in the transition. Right. So I'm curious about, you know, your relationship with your older brother, because, you you know, you mentioned him kind of being pulled into that kind of urban gang life. You know, sometimes that's a family thing, right? Did he ever want you to be in the gangs? Did you ever want to be like him? Or how did you think through that dynamic? Neither one. That's one thing we both agreed on is he was like, don't ever do what I'm doing. Mm. And he was like, I'm so proud of you. And mm. he says that to this day. Like, I'm so proud of you. Don't be like me. And mm. I hope y'all will pray with me for his salvation even to this day. Thankfully, thankfully he's alive. Thankfully, he got out of a lot of that street stuff when he was in his mid-20s. And I'm just thankful that he survived all of that. Mm. But he ended up going into the military. And so he's found a career there. So at least like, you know, doing something, right. you know, that's uh, a little bit better. Got but I, my whole prayer has always been like, I just hope that, you know, uh, he would be able to know his value, know his worth and not look right. down on himself and knowing that that God has a plan for him as well. Mm. Mm. So you weren't really drawn to that lifestyle, to the street. So at what point does academia and learning become a path that you look at? Yeah, you know, that actually happened the moment I was 17 years old. And again, by that time, I'd already been saved for a decade. Like I was calling myself a veteran in ministry. <laughs> like I, I was handing out tracts in seventh grade. You know, I started a Bible study my sophomore year of high school. I was involved in my church youth group. I was like, I was, you know, on fire for love. I was going on mission trips. I mm. went to Kazakhstan when I was 15 years old. Wow. Again, God gave me all these privileges. So when I was 17, I heard the voice of the Lord call me to ministry and to preach the gospel. And I just had a passion for, especially in my community, for people to know Jesus. And again, people like my brother and people like my best friends, JR and, and Brian and all the people I grew up with, I want them to know Jesus. And that was my heart. You know, I was 17. I was around that time thinking about, okay, I'm about to graduate high school. What am I going to do? Because again, mm. nobody in my family had been to college. And again, talking about those privileges, wow. like that that white church I was going to that was on the other side of the line. And again, this is this ties into why my passion is is really breaking the racial and socioeconomic barriers in theological education. Because as soon as I heard that voice right. of the Lord, my initial thought was, I need to go study. I want to study. I want to learn more about the word. If I'm going to be a, mm. a minister, if I'm going to be a pastor, I need to know more about this word because I read the word faithfully, but I had so many questions. I'd be reading the Bible and then I'd look in my footnote 
in the footnote, it would say, well, the Septuagint says da da da. And I'm like, the the sep the, the what? Like what what is this word? Like I don't I don't be knowing what this stuff means. And I'm asking people my little small Bible church and nobody knows what it means. And so I was like, I need to learn more. And so I'm I'm man, I'm going to my college fairs at my high school. And ain't nobody coming to my high school that got theology programs. Like, and I'm not trying to be like bougie or nothing mm-hmm. like that, but my hood blue collar context that I was coming out of was only trying to make me like go into the trades or into like service industry or stuff like that. That's what everybody, and again, I'm not trying to diminish that, but I know there's a lot of people from my community that want to do other things. I wanted to study right. theology and study the Bible and that path was not available. I'm going around to college for his, can I study the Bible at your school? Do you know, school where I study the Bible? Don't nobody know what my guidance counselor, they don't know what to tell me. My mom's trying to help me, but she don't know because my folks didn't go to college. Mm. So, like they're trying to help me out. And then somebody at my church mentions to my mom, well, I heard about this school called Wheaton up in Illinois. And I think it's like supposed to be the best Christian college. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going there. And that was the only school I applied to. My mom drove me up to Wheaton College. And there was a brother who was working there at the time. He ended up marrying my wife and I. He ended up becoming like the person whose wing I came under. But he was an admissions counselor at the time. (laughs) And he even told me that there was people that didn't want me there, right? Even when they did want students of color, they wanted a certain kind of student of color, right? And I wasn't Mm -hmm. the one. And so he like fought to get me in Mm -hmm. there. And so uh, it was really through God's grace and using him at that strategic moment. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got in and I wouldn't be doing maybe not any of the things I'm doing. And it just makes me think about how many people in the hoods of the world have a passion for God, have a passion for the gospel, are extremely talented and gifted, and they just don't have access to the evangelical mm. resources of our privileged evangelical world. Yeah. And that's what I want. That's my calling is to break those, right. you know, because I was sitting in my class and I'm just like, I'm drinking this stuff up. I'm learning Greek. I'm learning about theology. I'm learning systematic theology, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm finally getting to learn things academically that just supplement the faith that I've had in God my whole time. But like, I'm sitting across from all these white folks in my class and I'm like, Mm. they went to private Christian high school. So this is just like part two for them. They grew up in parents that went to this school also. And they're Mm. like kind of grandfathered in or whatever. And they grew up in churches where This was like normal to them. They grew up in a church where they have like pastors who write books and commentaries and stuff. And so they grew up in the evangelical world. And I didn't grow up in that. I didn't know what evangelical was. I was saved since I was seven years old. I didn't know. And then they said, are you evangelical? I'm like, I don't know. What is that? And then I I, I follow Jesus, (laughs) you know, but. (laughs) So let me, uh, let me, yeah, let me go take a step back. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm curious about how the, the vision matched the reality because, You get to this place that nobody in your family had gone to, probably even nobody in your church and your community had gone to because of all these different barriers sociologically and otherwise. And then you arrive. How did the experience, you know, with you as this young kid from West St. Louis match the reality when you got there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was in a different place at that time. It was like a phase of my life where I went real deep into a deep self-hatred of myself and my community. Mm -hmm. Right from that time when I mentioned that I heard the Lord when I was 17, you know, there was two things that popped in my head. I need to go learn more about the word. I need to be more prepared. But the other thought that came to mind was, all right, I need to really get both feet in following Jesus because I felt like I had one foot in church and one foot in the streets and in the hood culture. And I was like, I need to be all in for Jesus. And because I grew up in a white church, I did not have any context for black Christians. I knew black people and I identified as a black person, but nobody in my neighborhood went to church. Nobody in my family on that side or either side really went to church. So it wasn't like I thought all white people were Christians, but I felt subconsciously that all Christians were white. Because mm-hmm. that was my little microcosm world. And so nobody knew how to disciple me. And I grew up in a church. God bless them. Like God loves them. And they're, you know, they love the Lord. But, you know, I was, it was like typical, like God doesn't see color. Don't worry about color. Race mm-hmm. doesn't matter type of thing. And I had all these questions about it, being mixed, being from the segregated community, mm-hmm. crossing the line every day to go to school and to go to church and mm-hmm. seeing this radically different worlds that people are living in. And I'm being told, don't talk about it. Don't see it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist. So I mm-hmm. had to like almost stuff that or say, Well, I can't not see this. I don't know how y'all ain't seen this, but I guess a good Christian doesn't see these things, doesn't talk about these things. So I'm just going to not talk about it. And so that was what I started getting into. Um, How did that change? What what broke that through? Yeah, well, it was actually, ironically, it was really when I was at Wheaton that I felt God brought 
several different voices into my life where it really freed me from that because I like really went through a cultural transformation during that like two year period from 17 to 19. And I mean, I threw away all my Tupac, all my Biggie, all my, you know, <laughs> NWA, all my Drew Hill and, and Jodeci and all of that stuff. And I was like, I need to listen to Christian music. So I was just asking people in my church, what to listen to? So I'm listening now to Michael W. Smith and Newsboys and Jars of Clay and all this kind of stuff, Delirious because that's what they were listening to. And that's the only Christian music I knew of. And I'm like, even to the point where I'm dressing different. Like I get rid of my Carl Kanai, my my FUBU, my Jabos, my guest jeans, my Kango, all of that. And I'm starting to wear corduroys and cargo pants and mm. like all this kind of stuff because I'm thinking like, oh, that's I need to look like a Christian. I mean, but it was to the point where I even tried to perm my hair and mm. dyed it, you know, dyed it blonde because I'm like thinking wow. I'm, I need to look like a Christian. To me, it was a Christian. It wasn't a white person, but the way it was presented to me was that they're one and the same. And it, honestly, when, uh, the man I mentioned who was really a mentor to me at, in college, he was really the one that ministered to me, went through a similar thing. He grew up in the projects of Atlanta, but then came out and got a chance to go to Moody Bible Institute and went through his own identity thing and really shepherded me. And we went on a mission trip to New York City my freshman year, spring break. And it was on that trip where we were going through Acts chapter 10 and he was going through the story where God told Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, I've never touched anything unclean. And God said, don't call unclean what I have called clean. And I felt like the Lord was telling me that about myself, about my people. Mm. And I just like, I felt like I've given up my culture and I'm trying to be somebody else's culture because I think that's what a good Christian looks like. And I didn't know that I could be my own culture. Now, there were some parts of my culture that did need to change. Like I was fighting all the time and there was a certain way in the hood, you, you know, boys interact with girls and womanize right. and there was that kind of stuff that did need to change. But it wasn't like all of it. And right. for me, it was like a baby with the bathwater. And I would say like a couple of other things that God brought into my life when that broader Christian world opened up to me was also, I would give a definite shout out to Richard Twist, who, you know, was mm -hmm. a Lakota theologian who came and spoke and he was talking about his journey of feeling like his culture was mm -hmm. dirty or bad or demonic and then feeling freed up by Christ to drum and dance and mm -hmm. do all of that stuff. And that happened my freshman year. He spoke in my chapel and that was also instrumental. And then also uh, Dr. Soon Chan Ra came and spoke there mm -hmm. and he and I began a friendship and a mentorship that lasts even to this day but he was just taking me out for korean barbecue like last week and it was a real <laughs> blessing when the three of us got to speak together actually at a college like with my mentors mm -hmm. and then i would say the last thing that god brought into my life that was transformative for me was the music of cross movement yes. when somebody <laughs> handed me a cross movement cd i listened to it and i saw the brothers on the album and i was like i've never seen this before like i've never seen people who look like me who sound like me but they're praising jesus and they're following mm -hmm. jesus like i just i didn't even know that was possible when we come back, Vince will share about how his discovery of the ancient African roots of Christianity shattered the illusion that it is a white man's religion and revolutionized his understanding of himself, his faith and his scholarship. That's coming next on Where You're From. This episode is brought to you by Preaching Today. Are you tired of chasing down quality sermon illustrations? Need fresh ideas for helping your message connect? Each week, Preaching Today adds fresh content to our database of over 14,000 editor-screened illustrations. Quickly find the right story that will bring your message to life and help your people move closer to God. Get started today at preachingtoday.com. Hey y'all, before we get back to my conversation with Vince Bantu, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who has been with us for season five and to those who participated in our first ever giveaway. We will announce the winner on November 14th. So be sure to fill out the survey and while you're at it, like, subscribe, and give us some stars. Now let's get back to our conversation with Vince Bantu on where you're from. You know, it's interesting. Very few people understand or would relate to Peter's vision and acts and then relate that to their own personal experience correctly. Because a lot of times people think that that is primarily talking about food, not even talking about what God was doing with expanding the gospel and, and having the floodgates of it open to the Gentiles. So you you read this and you see yourself doing the same thing that Peter was doing with the Gentiles, but it, almost to yourself in your own culture. What was it about 
what you experienced in New York that caused you to realize that, you know, this is what I'm doing to me. I mean, it was really like we were uh, at that time, we stayed for that week at at the New York School of Urban Ministry over there in Long Island City. <laughs> and again, we were volunteering. We were going around different ministries, the the Bowery Mission. And yep. we went over there to Pastor Del Rio's church. And you know, we went up to El Pac with Bishop Ray Rivera. And, and we were just doing all kinds of things, Brooklyn Tab. But I think it was really just that time with my mentor during that week. Mm. Having somebody tell me, you know, really lead me through that story in a similar kind of way uh, mm-hmm. and ministering to me. And again, opening my eyes because like, number one, I felt like, you know, oh, I've been kind of hoodwinked because I've been told mm-hmm. race doesn't matter, color doesn't matter. And yet I have been thinking about it every second since the day I was born mm-hmm. <laughs> and I could not think about it. And yet I was told that a good Christian doesn't think about it and doesn't mm-hmm. talk about it. And now I'm like, oh, actually, the Bible talks about color. The Bible talks about difference. In fact, difference is a part of God's plan. And so I was like, oh man, I've been lied to. Like, I I don't, Hmm. I don't have to stuff this, this interest of mine. In fact, God is interested in, he created color. He created difference. And, And then I think the other thing too, was that I was being told conflicting messages. And this is the conflicting message that Western Christendom has sent for a long time. Like color and culture don't matter when you're a Christian, but you should act like this kind of people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so like, which one is it? Uh, And it's like kind of a weird mix of both. And so, you know, I had felt like I need to act and be like this culture. And I was thinking like my culture is just bad. And Mm -hmm. I was told that message in a million subtle indirect ways and Mm -hmm. a few direct ones. And so I think now I was like seeing like, man, what I was told is kind of like, I felt like I had to change it, but God is actually telling Peter sort of, sort of like the people who told me that they're kind of like Peter. Peter mm. thought Gentiles were unclean just right. all together. And he wouldn't want to be around Cornelius and God had to get him ready. Right. And so it's like, that's a message for anybody that would try to engage in what Dr. Rob calls cultural captivity of Christianity. But that often, most often happens with white Christian evangelicals of, of just kind of linking cultural and national identity with Christianity and presenting them as one and the same. And then also then denying its existence saying, oh, it's not a culture. It's just normal. It's just Mm -hmm. biblical values. It's like, well, yeah, there are biblical values, but sometimes things are cultural values and they start to bleed in. And so, yeah. No, that's good. So you have this Peter moment. And of course, I'm sure there's a progression as well. But how do you see that change when you get back into Wheaton, when you get back into this process of thinking about your calling? Yeah. I mean, I would say at first I went through like my sophomore year after I had kind of like come out of that two year period of like self-hatred and Mm -hmm. feeling like I have to deny my culture. I kind of went to the opposite extreme where I was in a really angry place with just white people, with white Christianity in particular, you know, and started learning more about the history of colonialism and slavery uh, and even the church's role in that. Things I hadn't obviously been taught as a you know young person growing up and just seeing the scope, the global scope of not only my story, but like how much damage like Western Christendom has done to the planet. And it really rocked my faith, not in God. Like I didn't have like a crisis of faith, like is God real or is God good? Or am I still called to ministry? But honestly, my feeling was like, are white people savable? Like, honestly, Mm. that was like my question I was really wrestling with. Like, Mm. honestly, the idea that I heard from Malcolm X that white people were the devil, Mm. like it was sounding really appealing to me at that time. Mm. But in that sense, that's where I went overboard with an over kind of bitterness of like even forgetting that all people, including white people, are made in the image of God and that God has a restorative plan for all people. But Mm. I just, I had to go through that, you know, Mm. and it was funny. I was talking to my white mother about that and, you know, she was even like, (laughs) it's okay, baby. Uh, You know, and so like, and I, I, knew that wasn't true. I was like, I know that. I know that don't apply to my mama though, because I used to get in fights with somebody talking about my mama. Um, but I was just thinking like, just, you know, in general, yeah. the spiritual dynamics of white supremacy and religious nationalism. I'm glad you shared that because that reveals the intensity of this struggle within yourself, that the very person that you had fought for and that had really introduced you to the faith is white and you love and appreciate and cherish her. She brought you into this world and then helped you come to to the faith. But then the overwhelmingness of finding out the legacy of, you know, slavery, of oppression, genocide, all these things that were explicitly baptized, quote unquote, by the leaders of the church throughout those times, that is something that's really difficult and to like kind of navigate through. So, 
when do you realize this is a, a conversation and this is information that I need to be a part in letting people know the truth? Yeah, I think that uh, also, like, you know, I want to give a shout out to another individual at Wheaton College named Dr. Brian Howell, anthropology professor there is a dope brother. He was also a white brother who really was instrumental in helping me navigate a lot of the dynamics of the challenges I was even facing at Wheaton, because uh, that was even difficult, right? Like going from like <laughs> working class, lower income obvious white racism in my high school neighborhood of being called right. an N-word to the more passive aggressive, polite, white evangelical, upper middle class racism <laughs> uh, that I experienced at, at, at Wheaton of like people clutching their purses or crossing the street or like, you know, girls asking to touch my hair and, you know, mm. all that kind of stuff. And like only seeing people of color as being relevant in syllabi or courses or or chapel or whatever, when it's like somebody's history month or something like that, right. you know? And so anyway, I just, you know, really came out of that, I think, bitterness stage and came back my junior year with this strong sense of like, all right, I want to work to bring reconciliation, mm. uh, you know, and I want to work to bring justice in the body of Christ. And I especially had a heart for like even studying anthropology along with theology had this strong sense of I want to really encourage people in the body of Christ, especially people of color, that they can be fully who they are culturally in Christ and actually be their truest and fullest selves. And that was really my heart and my passion going through the rest of college. And my wife, we got married right after we graduated and we ended up going to Boston for seminary. And I didn't know what seminary was. I thought, <laughs> I, w I thought what I was doing was seminary. Cause like I said, I was already in ministry and I, I came into college thinking about it like I'm in seminary, but then they're like, Oh, well, if you're going to be a pastor, you gotta go to seminary. I'm like, man, I thought that's what I was doing. Uh, Cause again, I was doing a lot, just going to college. Right. And then like, now I got to go to more school. Like, all right. But I was like, all right, I believe in reconciliation, but I need something that's a little bit more diverse because, and this is something I still feel is that I think that reconciliation needs to go both ways. It shouldn't just always be like people of color going into white platforms to help mm. diversify them, but it should also be white Christians going under black platforms mm. or, or Hispanic or Asian or indigenous. And so, and so I was like, I need something more diverse and something that will help prepare me for my context. And so my wife and I went to Boston. Uh, because we heard Gordon Conwell had an urban campus, an inner city focused campus where like almost all the faculty and students were people of color. It was really diverse. And so my wife and I got married in 2005. Uh, and then we both moved to Boston as newlyweds and both got our MDivs together at Gordon Conwell's urban campus. And my experience at the urban campus, that was when God really brought home and solidified his sense of call for me it, vocationally in particular, not only how to specifically engage that calling of encouraging people of color around our identity through the vehicle of ancient church history, but also even just going into academics, period, but with a specific focus on, as I said earlier, I wanted to, I was like, all right, I was privileged to come out the hood and go to a Christian college and all that. But there's a lot of people, like I said, who don't have that opportunity. I want to break those walls and I want to be able to make it more readily accessible to people in marginalized communities. And seeing that campus of Gordon Conwell and how they were doing it in the inner city, I was like, I want to do something like that. Mm. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of something like that. But the reason I felt called to add an addition to the pastor call, the academic piece was specifically for the purpose of bringing contextual, relevant theological education into marginalized mm. communities, but in especially in the black community. Okay. So I got to, you know, pause. I, I love you giving these shout outs to these folks along the way. Tell me a little bit about your then girlfriend, now wife, that, you know, makes this journey with you from Wheaton to Gordon Conwell. You make it with her. Y'all make it together. What was the role that she played as you were going through this pretty extreme transition, right, from trying to assimilate to then being a separatist <laughs> to then being having this vision for the kingdom and the community of God being together? Yeah, I mean, she was in college what she's always been for me, which is like my partner my soulmate, my guide, like we were going in it together because she What's had a similar name? story. Her name is Deanna. Uh -huh. And even that is part of the testimony because she had always gone by Diana. Hmm. That's her name. My wife is also biracial. Hmm. Her dad's Puerto Rican and her mom is white. 
And she grew up in, you know, uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is, you know, the hood yep. part of Jersey, you know, and she had a very similar story. Hmm. Grew up in the hood as a kid, but then parents moved out to the white suburbs, uh, you know, Morris County in New Jersey. And then it, you know, first one to really be saved. Unfortunately, she didn't have that family support that I did, at least with my mom. She really just heard the gospel and got saved and, you know, really went to church on her own initiative. Mm. And then she ended up going to Wheaton, also wanting to go to a Christian school and go deeper in her, her new faith, which she had just got saved, like in the middle of high school and also was kind of you know, going through her own identity. And so even by the fact of going deeper and learning Spanish, because her family kind of came from more of a dynamic of assimilate, right? And blend in. And so she would say, no, I want to represent and be proud of my Puerto Rican heritage. And, mm. and you know, because as much as she was taught to blend in and no, you're American, you only speak Spanish, da, da, da. She still, because of how she looks growing up, especially in the white community, like I did when they moved to that, she was racialized and being called a packy and a, mm. and, you know, a towel head and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, walking to school. So it's like, I still can't escape my physicality. And so how do I get vocabulary to think about that? And we were like both going through that journey together as she was coming into realization and went back and learned Spanish. So she's the only one of her siblings, mm. uh, that speaks Spanish. And, you know, she said, I want to be called Diana. I don't want to, you know, instead of Diana. Mm. Uh, and so, and just in, in really, you know, going deeper into her. So that's a passion of both of ours that we've also been on this journey with. We got two daughters and, you know, really try to be intentional about giving them a sense of their multiracial heritage. Yeah. Which, you know, y'all, y'all kind of span the entire diaspora, right? (laughs) I I be saying, I'm I'm telling my babies, I'm like, all right, y'all need to just marry like a Chinese dude. Then that's it. It's a wrap. (laughs) My my grandkids going to be the (laughs) everything. Oh man, that's great. So one thing that's kind of counterintuitive to me is you you get this picture, uh, this vision of what it could look like to do urban relevant ministry in Boston and Gordon Conwell in today's world, the 21st century. How does that cause you to then go to and st- go back to the third and fourth century and say this is where we need to really learn in order to have context for today? Yeah, I mean, you know, at that time in the 2000s, a lot of the different religious groups in the black community, they weren't as present in my city in St. Louis or the South of the Midwest yet, but I was now in Boston. Like, and my campus of Gordon Conwell is, is still there. It's in Roxbury. That's Malcolm X's neighborhood. So the nation is almost thick in that neighborhood. And I was like, what is this? Like, what's wrong with y'all Negroes? Like, y'all know y'all grew up in church. Like, what y'all doing? And so I was doing ministry in the inner city of Boston and, and I was encountering this and I was like, wow, this is like what I dealt with. But even on a whole other level of like, I grew up feeling like Christianity is is a white thing and I have to be white and all that. And I was, I dealt with Christianity not being presented to me in a relevant context, but it really touched my heart. And I was like thinking about these issues. And, you know, I'm still really interested in issues of missiology and contextualization. And again, helping believers own the gospel, especially as I was engaging folks in the streets of Boston, like, no, this is not a white man's religion. Like you don't have to, you know, and I I had just come out of that myself. I was like, you don't have to negate who you are culturally. And so I'm reading all these books on missiology, on contextualization, on racial justice, and I'm reading all this stuff and I'm loving it. But when I, my first year at at Gordon Conwell, I also saw that they were offering a class and it was called the Africans of the Bible in early church. And it was actually a trip to Egypt. The class was in the form of a trip to Egypt and shout out uh, at, at our seminary meet school. I haven't, we're actually doing a similar trip to Ethiopia this coming February. So holler at your boy, if y'all want to go, uh, but I'm trying to, you know, give back what I experienced. But when I went on this trip, that was the first time I had ever heard of the early church in Africa, in Egypt, in Nubia, in Ethiopia. I had never heard of any of it. And I was a little in my feelings because I'm like, I just went to a Christian college and studied theology and I didn't hear none of this stuff. Y'all ain't tell me about this. And so, you know, I really, uh, I was just, I was gripped with that. And I, I felt like, wow, I did not know this. And I think a lot of people don't know this. And the trip I was on, it had like black pastors and leaders who were, you know, seasoned and they were like, I've never heard of this before. And people were in tears like, wow, the gospel has been here from the beginning. It didn't show up in African slave ships. Like it was so powerful. And I was like, I have got to learn more about this because I felt like a lot of stuff I was reading in the fields of missiology or contextualization or, you know, racial justice or urban ministry. It was all great stuff. I was really being at that time, really molded by like also the philosophy of CCDA, like John Perkins and Mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff. I think it's all great. But I just felt like, man, this is a missing piece of the conversation because a lot of that stuff usually is it only goes back maybe one or two or at the most 400 years. Mm. Like and it's looking at 
issues of like white supremacy and colonialism and Christianity from the 1400s on. And now how can we unpack that, decolonize that, de-oppress that or anti-colonial, mm-hmm. post-colonial, whatever. And I'm like, Okay, but these brothers in ancient Africa, they didn't have to decolonize nothing. They mm-hmm. didn't have to anti-colonize nothing because they, in some cases, they never were colonized. Ethiopia <laughs> never been colonized. And so they have a colonial theology. It's not mm. post-colonial. Wow. It's not decolonial. It's our colonial. There was no colonialism. And I was like, man, that's a missing piece of the puzzle because we need to know that Christianity is not just from the West to the rest, but it's always been in Africa and Asia and taken diverse forms. And so that was really when I, I just knew I had to... Yeah. Just dedicate my life to to learning about that and sharing it with the world. That's great. Uh, let me just quote you to yourself. In a multitude of all peoples, you write, it is understandable that some African-Americans perceive Christianity as an oppressive religion, given the role Christianity has played in white hegemony in United States history. So, you know, you kind of, and again, even through your own experience, have wrestled with that. So- why is it based on that sentence so important to go back to an a colonial church or a pre-colonial church in order to to make this point, especially when most of those who are descendants of African slaves today, like myself, our ancestry comes more from the West of Africa, you know? So to some degree, one could say, well, yeah, that might have been nice for Ethiopia, but that's not really the ancestry here. So why should that matter? So it kind of helped us understand why ancient church history is relevant for someone who perceives Christianity as an oppressive religion. Yeah, that, that, I think that's a great question. I mean, if somebody sees Christianity as an oppressive religion, and in many cases it has been, especially in the West, but if we think that's all of the story, then we're going to think that's what Christianity is. And then you got these people, you know, coming up with crazy theories like Constantine invented Christianity and hmm. he invented the doctrine of Jesus divinity and he decided on the Bible canon. So it was invented by the Roman Empire as a mechanism to oppress people. And then later Europeans used it to enslave Africans. And, and, and it's still the case today. I, I went to Senegal, which is a predominantly Muslim country. And I was talking with some pastors there about African church history. And they were saying, this is powerful. We didn't know about this. And people here need to hear about it because everybody here is a Muslim. And and when they think of Christianity, they think of the house of slaves, which is on Gori Island Mm. in Dakar. And that had a church in it. (laughs) And Mm. so it was by so-called Christians enslaving Africans. So when they think of Christianity, that's what they think of. And they Mm. think of that's the beginnings of Christianity. So Mm. it's understandable that Mm. somebody would associate, oh, Christianity, slave castles, those two things just go together. They're the same genesis. And it's not just in the black community, but all around the world. This is the biggest gospel issue in the world. The perception, the false perception that Christianity is the white man's religion is the single greatest obstacle to the spread of the gospel in the world, Mm -hmm. in the world. Why? Because most people in the world are not white. (laughs) Most people in the world are people of color. And if you talk to non-Christians in the majority world, And ask them, why are you not a Christian? Why do they not want to be a Christian? I guarantee you, hands down, without competition, the number one reason is because, oh, well, because Christianity, that's not for my people. That's a Western religion. That's an American religion. That's a white religion, whatever the case may be. That's in China. That's in Japan. That's in India. That's in Saudi Arabia. That's in Nigeria. Like anybody that's not a Christian, then somebody want to come and say, okay, well, Vince, you know, but the gospel is blowing up in the global South. Now that's the center of gravity for Christianity. I'm like, okay, praise God. That's what's up. But how often is it a very Westernized version? of Christianity Mm -hmm. that's being imported into Africa and Latin America and South and Southeast Asia. And where you got people from all over the world singing white Australian worship songs or pastors from all over the world quoting and only reading and being theologically educated by white or European male theologians just translate into their language and reduplicating those same cultural norms and shunning the cultural practice of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So that will only exacerbate in people's minds. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. When I see my own people converting to Christianity, all of a sudden they start acting real white. (laughs) They start Mm. acting real American. They start Mm. acting real Western and they're anti their own culture in almost every way. And so that's really, I think, uh, why it's so important because it's not only enough that Christianity is everywhere, but also that it can be imagined and worship and theology can be contextualized. Mm. And when we look at the early history, that helps us see that 
Christians have been doing that since day one. It didn't only come from the West. Mm. Now, the last thing I'll say, you mentioned West Africa, but first of all, I would say that I was just actually in the capital of the Ashanti kingdom and the chiefs of the Ashanti kingdom were saying that the Ashantis originate from Egypt and they migrated over. Well, Egypt was mostly Christian since like the first century. And so that there's also already a West African connection and many other tribes in Nigeria and m- most West Africans have this idea that they migrated from Nubia or from Egypt hundreds of years ago. And so there's still that connection to East Africa. But l- second of all, and this is actually the subject of my new research, is that there's actually evidence to show that Christianity was in West Africa also before Europeans ever showed up. And so it wasn't just in East, but it was in all, it was all over the continent. And that again, that helps us see that Christianity is, is much bigger and has a much longer history among black people. No, that's great. So, you know, you in your book, Gospel, Hey Manat, A Constructive Theology and Critical Reflection on African and Diasporic Christianity, kind of use a lot of terms that originate in different various African languages. I'm kind of curious, like just as an example of some of this project, what have you uncovered or discovered that these diasporic expressions of faith in Christ have contributed to you that make it not just kind of a, you know, a good apologetic talking point, but that have actually formed your faith? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that I I think there's a lot of ways, you know, one way in particular is reading people like in the ancient African context, like Shenouda of Atreep, the greatest writer in the history of the Egyptian or Coptic language, who's a Christian, one of Earth's oldest language families, Egyptian, right? And the, and the most prolific author in that language family is a Christian theologian from the 400s. But he was a monastic leader who really saw no divorce between social justice and theological orthodoxy. And we live in a a day where that's really become like a, a rift and a binary where you talk about justice for some people. And that's like a dirty word. But then you say something like orthodoxy, and that's a dirty word for other people. And it just shows that there's a strong faith of how those things went to completely together. I think about people like Zari Yacoub, a philosopher from the 16th century, one of the first African philosophers who was really asking similar questions about the nature of knowledge and knowing and the nature of God and existence and the human soul, but in very unique ways, contemporary or before people like Kant and Hegel and and other people like that. I think of people like Ephraim the Syrian who wrote in Syriac and actually did did theology through the mechanism of poetry, musical poetry mm. that was communal and meant to be sung many in many similar ways like Negro spirituals in the black church tradition. And he had a theological approach that was different than his contemporaries in the fourth century where he approached theology more just adoring the mystery of who God is and all the complexity and also the role of nature and creation. How it's a, it is an active participant in declaring the goodness of God and part of God's revelation, something that African rooted and indigenous peoples understand that creation speaks. The Bible says creation speaks. And so seeing theology that that embrace the speaking of creation, I'm translating a text from Georgius of Sagla, who was the first known sub-Saharan African prose author in human history, who was an Ethiopian theologian, wrote a 700 page systematic theology. And all throughout it, he's using the Bible and he's using creation. He's literally beckoning the moon and the stars and the sun and seeing how they speak of the goodness of God and speak the mysteries of the Trinity and and all of that kind of stuff. So just seeing how these things coalesce, right? Even the way in which he talks about the sun functioning, that that's a part of all African cultures. Even Phyllis Wheatley wrote about the sun in her poetry. And so that's a part of African culture that that goes back to ancient Egypt and Nubia and even into West Africa that that's been a part of our ancestry. And so seeing how ancient Christians found ways to Mm. embrace that in a biblical sense and in a crystal centric way. Wow. That's a lot. And that's just off the top of your head. Oh, man, we could be all day. I got like 100 more, but I just want to give at least a few okay. little highlights. No, that's great. That's great. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the issue of the the holistic nature of the gospel and especially understanding the value of justice and righteousness, personal piety and sanctification with systemically trying to bring about the kingdom of God, I would imagine that that is a particularly important insight that the ancient church offers in light of the last 500 years of the kind of, um, you could say, syncretism between power, you know, empire and trying to put a Christian glaze on it. So that is kind of in particular something that's of value to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. So another thing that's kind of interesting, anybody that's become acquainted with your work 
you know, we'll see even with the word Hamanot, hey, hey, please explain what that is. And, and just why do you choose to invoke African languages in describing words and themes as you write? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's that we got to, right? I mean, this podcast is called, where are you from? You know, it's like, where are you from? <laughs> right. Uh, right. I mean, we have to embrace our culture in terms of how we walk with God, how we do theology. Hmm. I mean, even just that word in and of itself, hymenote is an example of how African and originated theology is, is, is instructed from my faith practice. The word hymenote means faith, but it actually means a lot of things. It means theology. It means faith. It means doctrine. It means lifestyle conduct. It speaks to how in an Ethiopian mindset, how again, action is not divorced from belief, but right belief and right action have to go together and praxis and, and, you know, orthodoxy go together. Mm -hmm. Even like in my own spiritual life, honestly, like there was an indigenous Nubian Kushite goddess who was named Tilla. And when the Nubians became Christian in the sixth century, and they started translating the Bible into the Nubian language. They translated the word God as their own word that they already had for a very prominent goddess named Tilla. So the, in the Nubian language, in the Bible, when you see like Theos in Greek, or you see Elohim or Adonai in Hebrew, they translated that into Tilla. Mm -hmm. And in Egyptian, it was Nuta, which is actually a shout out to Netjer, which is an ancient Egyptian god as well. And mm. so I, in my own prayer life, I refer to, to the creator now as Tilla because mm. I'm using, I'm invoking the name of, of the common ancestor of all black people, Nubia, mm. right? Mm. Uh, you know, like Nubians are the original black people and all black people originate from them. And so to be able to refer to the creator in the word and in the name that our common African ancestors did, it's a very empowering thing. So I, I, I talk to God, right? And somebody mm. like, well, that's syncretism. We're, go do an etymology search for the word God, and then maybe you'll <laughs> rethink that. <laughs> because the word God is related to the name Odin from mm. Norse mythology. So Europeans took names of gods that they already had, and when they became Christian, they just used those words. In right. fact, the name El in Hebrew actually itself was a Canaanite pagan name that Moses probably got from his father-in-law Jethro, <laughs> and then God takes that name upon himself. Mm. And just like Jesus takes the pagan concept of Logos and mm. takes that title upon himself, mm. right? And so that's contextual and so I think, especially when we think about doing apologetics and evangelism and missions to people, especially black people who specifically don't want to be Christian because they see it as not just a conversion of the heart and of lifestyle, but I have to culturally convert to right. some other European thing. It's like, no, you don't completely. In fact, for me, the more I go deeper in my faith with Christ, the more it takes me deeper into my African origins and into my African American mm. culture. And it makes me go yeah. even deeper into that. We, and again, when you go into seminary, you you get inundated with Greek and Latin words. Everything is like terminus antiquim and and creatio ex nihilo and and zitzim laban and 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 like hypostasis and 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 perichoresis and all these Greek terms and Latin terms, all these Europe, even French and German terms, not even biblical languages, but it makes everybody feel fancy when they use these European <laughs> terms. And these white folks over here and these scholars, they ain't, they ain't French, they ain't, Ger they ain't Greek, they ain't <laughs> Italian, Roman, but they use these terms. And, and even in liturgy, people use those terms, right? right? But right. we as black people, African descent, we can also draw upon the ancestry as well. This is where you're from. I'm Rasul Berry. And remember, it's not just about where you're at. It's also about where you're from. This show was produced by Ryan Clevenger, Mary Jo Clark, and Jade Gussman, and was engineered by Kevin Burgess. Also want to thank Bobby and Steven for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries.